Hi, and welcome to Hypnotize Me, the podcast about hypnosis, transformation, and healing. This is Dr. Elizabeth Bonet, and I'm your host. Disclaimer time! This podcast is not a substitute for mental health treatment, nor should it be. If you need therapy or hypnotherapy, please seek a trained professional. I do hypnosis all over the world, so if you'd like to learn more about me, you can do that at my website, drlizhypnosis.com. That's D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. Now on to our episode. Hi, everyone. It is February, and I'm part of a podcast exchange called Spreading the Podcast Love, and I'm just going to talk a little bit here about another podcast that's part of my podcasting group that I'm on and on uh, Facebook. The course is called The Healthcasters, and it is how I started podcasting. Melvin Varghese is the one who runs that course, and he is excellent. So if you're thinking about doing a podcast and you're in like the health arena, then I highly, highly recommend his course. He also has a Facebook group that is incredibly supportive of your journey as a podcaster. So all of the podcasts that I'm talking about in February come from that podcasting group, and these are really lovely people. The first one is called The Mindful Expat, and an expat is someone who lives like outside of their home country. It's run by Dana Nelson, and it is a really nice podcast. She has a good pace. She talks all about the experience of being an expat and how you can make that experience better and take care of your own mental health. So people who live abroad have particular struggles that are unique to that experience. Sometimes that's a struggle in their partnership and their marriage. Sometimes it's a struggle navigating the country. Sometimes it's finding work, like all of these different areas she talks about on this podcast. So I highly suggest give it a listen, Mindful Expat. And I'll put a link to her podcast in the show notes as well. But her website is at www.mindfulexpat.com. So give that a listen. All right, let's go on to the episode today. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. I was in Seattle last week visiting a close, close friend that I've known since graduate school, so a long time, and we had such a nice time out there, but it was cold and rainy for sure. I actually loved the briskness of the temperature and the weather. And I love the houses out there. They're so wonderful and charming. And the whole vibe is Seattle. But I'm also happy to be home down here in South Florida where it's warmer. Although we have a cold front coming through. A cold front to us is like 50 degrees. So we break out the coats for that, 50 degrees. I know a lot of people break out the shorts for 50 degrees if you live in the north. But not here in South Florida. And then... The other big thing that's happening this week is that I'm moving offices. So I'm only moving, I don't know, less than half a mile away, but it's a new office and it's a big transition. And I struggle with transitions, to be honest. They're really difficult for me. I try my best to turn that into excitement rather than dread. (laughs) I know a lot of people are so excited. Like most of my friends are more excited about my new office than I am. (laughs) Like, they're like, it's wonderful. Like the vibe of the office is great. And they're so excited about decorating it. And for me, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to pack up all this stuff out of my old office, hire the movers and, you know, do all this stuff, all the detail stuff. So it creates a little bit of stress and anxiety in me for sure. So I thought this week we would talk about panic disorder, I'm not in a panic about moving offices. I actually don't have panic disorder. I absolutely know what a panic attack feels like. I've had several throughout my life at different points in time, but currently I don't really have them. And I definitely had some come on, I don't know, about six months ago, maybe a little bit less when I had a personal crisis happen in my life. Anxiety is more of my go-to, let's say, than depression. For some people, their default is depression when something awful happens or something upsetting happens. And 
for years that was actually mine. I've been through several bouts of depression in my life, but generally what comes first for me is anxiety. Anxiety has a certain energy to it. I actually prefer to be anxious than depressed. Depressed is like, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to get out of my bed. I wake up feeling like the day ahead of me is just so long. And could I just stay here in bed? And I don't want to do anything. And I much prefer anxiety, even if it means that I can't sleep and I'm having a panic attack here and there, or um, I'm worrying and worrying and worrying. It has a certain energy to it that I feel like at least I'm getting things done. Okay, so sometimes anxiety gets so bad that you can't get things done. That's often when I see people in my office, like they feel like they can't go to work, they can't um, drive, they can't get anything on their list done, like it, it debilitates them. It's, it's really bad, actually. But generally for me, it doesn't get to that point. So it's just more like paying attention to my body and figuring out how to control my body. Because with anxiety and panic attacks, you often feel like your body has betrayed you. Like that's, that's the rub there, right? Like you can't control your body. Like it's sort of taken off on its own and there it goes. And part of my job as a clinician is to help people once again, control their body, control their responses, control how they react to things. It's not even necessarily like we're going to take anxiety away because anxiety serves a function for people. Often it keeps you from stepping off the curb into like ongoing traffic and all kinds of stuff. It has a function in our lives, but it's more like, all right, if anxiety comes up and you feel like it's at a certain level, how do you then control it? How do you then bring your body back into homeostasis? How do you bring your body back into where it feels comfortable, where it feels good? So that is really the task of hypnosis and psychotherapy when someone steps into my office for anxiety. Now, I absolutely love working with it. Like I am an anxiety specialist. I've studied it and studied it. You know, all these different steps you take to become a specialist. And I absolutely love working with it partly because the results are so fast. <laughs> like when, once I sit down and teach someone about what's going on, some of that is education. It's not just reflection. You know, I'm going to pause here for a moment. I had a friend, this must have been 10 years ago, where he went into a therapist's office. He said that all the therapist did was say, uh-huh. Like literally the whole time, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he didn't really find it helpful. <laughs> and he asked her about it. And she's like, well, you're here to talk. Now that is one perspective. Okay. And perhaps talking for some people where they just talk and the therapist just says, uh-huh, works. Like, I'm not going to say that doesn't work because you never know. For me, part of what I do when I work with people is education. Like, let's look at the anxiety model. Let's look at what keeps an anxiety disorder, quote unquote, going. Let's look at the steps that happen. Because I really feel like if someone understands what's happening, then they can gain more control over it. If they don't understand what's happening, then you're just sort of left in this hazy field of feeling out of control and anxious, right? So I do quite a bit of what we call psychoeducation, meaning here's a handout. Let's look at it. Let's review it. Tell me your thoughts about it. But I want you to gain the understanding of what's going on. And all this understanding, all these handouts come from research and books. And, and I really meant to help the client understand. That's the whole point of them. And get their anxiety under control. So it's not just like, let's understand what's going on. Let's look at the whys. It's also, what are the practical steps that you can do to help your anxiety come back under control? So it's two parts in that. So some of the session focuses on those handouts and talking about it, understanding what's going on. And some of the session focuses on practical steps, what we can do. And we go through scenarios. We go through them in our office. So tell me what happened this week and let's break it down and let's see what you were thinking and what happened in this step and this step and this step and this step and 
What could we have done differently? What could you have done differently here, 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 and here? Okay, now what's your plan for the week? And then they go out and they try it and they come back and we do the feedback. All of that comes together to reduce panic attacks and anxiety in general. So now that I've given you some of the background, so let's talk about what a panic disorder really is. Okay, so there's anxiety that most people feel, like let's say you're getting pulled over for a speeding ticket or you're about to take an exam or something like that. Okay, that's considered transient anxiety. Everybody gets nervous. And then once the event is over, the nervousness, anxiety passes. Generally, it may last a little bit while you may replay it for, I don't know, anywhere from an hour or so, maybe even into the next day, but then generally it's gone. You move on with your life versus when something becomes an anxiety disorder, it's not often brought on by anything in the environment, external circumstances. It sometimes comes out of the blue. It feels like it's a heightened level of anxiety that takes over somebody's body And it generally gets worse if left untreated. It doesn't get better on its own. It's not like it passes. So any given year, it's about 3% of adults in the United States are diagnosed with panic disorder. And approximately 45% of those cases are classified as severe. That's based on research that was published in about 2005. I know we're in 2018 now, and I'm guessing it's much higher than that. But I know the median age of onset of panic disorder is between 20 to 24 years of age, with women outnumbering men at a rate of approximately two to one. So that's a really interesting result. And that was published in 2013. What is a panic attack? Okay, so when you're having a panic attack and it goes on to the level of panic disorder, it's lasted for six or more months. And it's characterized by unexpected events, including intense fear accompanied by cognitive and physical symptoms that may include fear of dying, fear of going crazy, quote unquote, chest pain, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, excessive perspiration, dizziness, abdominal distress, nausea. So all of these things happen and they're brought on um, sometimes by events, sometimes out of the blue. Speaking from personal experience, these are awful. My ex-husband in his 20s also had panic disorder, and we ended up at the hospital thinking he was having a heart attack several times before a cardiologist sat across a desk from him in his office and said, you have panic disorder, and you're going to have to learn how to deal with this with your mind. Okay, this isn't something physical that we deal with. Like this is, your heart is in great condition. It's in perfect condition. So you're going to have to learn how to talk yourself out of these and to do breathing. That's where a psychologist steps in (laughs) or a mental health counselor, whatever you want to call them, is we teach that cognitive part. And that's often how someone ends up in our office is they thought they were having a heart attack. They went to the emergency room and they said, nope, your heart is perfectly fine. That was a panic attack. And they wouldn't help for that because obviously that's a very scary feeling to feel like you're going to die and go to the ER. It's really scary and traumatic for everybody. So how about we learn a different way to deal with them? And how about we decrease them? And some people eliminate them completely. They'll go years and years not having a panic attack or never again. That's also a possibility that once they learn what they are and what to do with them, They never have one again in their life. Let me just state that right there. It doesn't get said enough because most people talk about reducing it, but I've known people personally and I've had clients who just never had one again once they learned how to work with them and brought them under control. So the typical length of a panic attack is about 20 minutes. Sometimes they're shorter Sometimes they're longer. They can go on for a couple of hours, but generally it's about 20 minutes. And part of that is based on physiology, like our, our body and what it can handle. Generally, there's a peak to it, and then you get over the hump of that, and you come back to more of a normal resting state. Your body does. Sometimes your mind doesn't. 
your mind sometimes is still freaking out about what just happened and oh my God, and I had to pull the car over and what if that happens again? And then that leads to more anxiety. This fear that it's going to happen again leads to even more anxiety and sometimes increases that chance that it's going to happen again. So what is the treatment like? Let's get to some of the practical now that we talked about what a pain attack feels like. So I know some of these thoughts intimately. I know when I was having panic back in the fall last year, 2017, part of the fear that I had was, what if this never stops? And I had to just talk to myself and let myself know, hey, my body can only maintain this for a certain while. And then physiologically, my body will crash. This gave me great comfort. <laughs> At some point, my body would get so tired that I'd have to go to sleep and I could sleep and that would be a relief, even if it's a couple hours and then everything would go back to normal. And maybe anxiety would come the next day, which it did. This went on for a couple of weeks, but I always knew it's going to end. And often what happens is that people think it's never going to end. They don't have tools to work with it. Like I had all these tools to work with it. I could break up my worksheets, which I did. I could grab onto a thought that made me feel calmer instead of more anxious, which I did. I could do all these different things to help me control it. I had all the education about what it was, what was going on. So I had that in my back pocket as well. And all of these things gave me great comfort until I went to a level that felt more like me again, felt more normal, felt more manageable. So sometimes in there too, let's talk about sleep for a minute, because often what I hear from people with anxiety is that they cannot sleep. And that's part of what drives them so nuts, right? What makes you feel so crazy is like sleep isn't um, seen as like sleep is going to come, it's going to be a comfort. But when you actually talk to them and break it down, and sometimes when you talk to their partners who are sleeping with them, you get a very different picture. So they are getting usually chunks of sleep here and there. Usually they're getting four or five hours. Usually they're, sometimes they're getting even more than that, but they're not waking up feeling like they did. So perhaps they had anxious dreams or nightmares. Um, I am going to say right here that I'm not really talking about PTSD and anxiety. That's a whole different animal there. I'm talking about straight anxiety disorders, panic disorder that doesn't have PTSD associated with it. So when you talk to their partners, often their partners will say, well, actually they slept the whole night, but they woke up saying they didn't sleep at all because somewhere in there, they're waking up in little fits and starts, or they're having anxious dreams, or they're not going into deep, deep sleep, something like that, that makes them feel like they haven't slept. So if that's you, I encourage you to check it out with a partner if you have one. If you don't have one, then what you can do is start logging some of your sleep. So you keep a pad of paper beside your bed. I don't suggest your phone because once you get on your phone, it wakes you up with the light and stuff, but a small pad of paper by your bed. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, you just jot down the time and then you try to go back to sleep and you do that when you wake up and you may get a very different picture of what's going on than when you're just in your head. You know, when my kids are smaller, and they would get sick. They get sick more as little kids than big kids. Everything would feel worse in the middle of the night. Okay. Everything feels like a crisis in the middle of the night. And I learned at one point over time that if I would just wait until the sun came up, then I would feel very differently about what's going on. And that's the same with sleep. When you're going through an anxious episode or a period of anxiety or some big change in your life, sometimes what happens is at night, it all feels like a crisis. And that's why you feel like you haven't slept the whole night. You're waking up thinking about it, 
But something to tell yourself is, you know, when the sun comes up, when it's the light of day, things are going to feel different and chances are they're going to feel better. It's not going to feel like such a huge weight on you. Once you wake up and you get some coffee or some tea or whatever you like to drink in the morning and things are going to feel better. So let's break this down as if we're in my office though. So Let's use the move since I just talked about that and it's upcoming and it's an easy one for me. In the middle of the night, I'm thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do all of this? How am I going to pack up my office? Which movers am I going to use? Is my stuff going to make it there okay? What's going to break? How am I going to get the new furniture for the office? Like all this stuff comes in a jumble. Okay, and I'm using this as like an easy example. I know a lot of people have much harder examples, like someone's in the hospital or they're worried about their health or um, they've had a personal breakup. Breakups are huge anxiety times. But I'm just using this easy one so that we can look at it. So in the middle of the night, all of that feels overwhelming. And then I have the opportunity to do a couple of things in the middle of the night. I have the opportunity to say, all this is going to feel more manageable in the morning. So how about I just go back to sleep? (laughs) I have the opportunity to do that. I also have the opportunity to say, Elizabeth, you're catastrophizing, meaning like I'm making this into some catastrophe that it's not. I'm in my head somehow the movers have dropped all my furniture, broken it all, and I have to buy only furniture for the new office. Okay. (laughs) So I'm catastrophizing, right? I also have the opportunity to say, Elizabeth, you're going into black and white thinking, like everything's going to be great or everything's going to be awful. And generally when I'm in anxiety state, I tend to think everything's going to be awful. Okay. But it's a black and white. There's no in between. Like some of this will be stressful. Maybe one of your things will get broken, but not everything right? So that's an example of black and white thinking. And I have a whole list of these things that we go over in my office and that most anxiety therapists go over when you're talking about how your thoughts run away with themselves. They're sometimes called thinking errors. And so people take um, issue with that term, which I always find interesting that they say, well, you're really pathologizing someone's thoughts. And it's like, well, yeah, right. Like these are not like right in the head thoughts that I have in the middle of the night. I don't know about you, but I have some crazy thoughts in the middle of the night. They're not (laughs) real. They have nothing to do with reality. And often when you're in the middle of them, you can't see that it does take someone else to help you see, Hey, you know, everything's going to be okay, or some things are going to go perfectly fine. And maybe some things won't, and you'll struggle with some things and that's okay. So sometimes that's a therapist. Sometimes that's a friend. Sometimes that's your mom, right? Or your dad, um, or a sister or brother. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's some random stranger that you talk to while you're like standing in line at Starbucks or on the bus or something. It can often be that too. So you never know where these sources come from. But it's often someone else's perspective that gives you perspective. And that's sort of my point here is you can learn to do this yourself. You can learn to bring your anxiety down yourself. But sometimes it takes the perspective of someone else to help you learn to do that. So that's an easy example of some of the practical things you can do in the middle of the night when anxiety comes up. So we do some of these practical things. We look through the thinking errors. We often do worksheets around, well, I can choose to think this thought and it's going to make me feel bad. And I actually have this worksheet for free on my website. I did a video, I don't know, a couple months ago and gave it on the website for free through a blog post. So you can always get that. I think if you join the newsletter, I'll put it on that thank you page as well on the newsletter so that... You can join the newsletter, get a hypnosis file and get the worksheet. So what the worksheet does is it goes through these different ways of thinking and it has you rate it. So, okay, if I have the thought that 
I'm not going to be moved in and I won't be able to see clients, <laughs> then that causes me a lot of anxiety. So that's probably an eight or nine on a scale of one to 10 for me. But if I choose to think probably the move will go well, I'll at least have my couch and chairs set up so that people can come in and talk and I will be able to see clients. Then my anxiety goes down to like a two or three. I can choose which one to think, and maybe the disaster one will pop up without me doing anything, right? It does pop up without me doing anything, like, oh my God. But then I can choose to think, okay, well, at least I'll have my couch and chairs and I'll be able to see clients. Maybe the office won't be perfect at first, but I have the sweetest clients. Like they are all so excited about my move, actually. Haven't heard one of them be like, oh my God, no way. Can't believe you're moving here. They're really excited about the new office. So I'm sure they're going to give me some leeway in terms of getting it set up. That thought helps me bring that anxiety down to a two or three. So you can do this with anything. The worksheet walks you through that. And if you find yourself stuck on the worksheet, so I did have one friend who's like, oh, I tried your worksheet and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I'm like, what do you mean you couldn't do it? <laughs> it's like he wasn't able to step out of his own perspective and think of another thought that may bring him less anxiety, that may reduce the anxiety. And this is often what I see with people, particularly who struggle with anxiety a long time without getting help and without getting some tools in their toolbox, is that they do get stuck. They cannot think of another way to think of things. And it does take a friend, a relative, a psychologist, (laughs) some kind of professional help sometimes to help them begin to see things different ways. It's not just him. I've had that in my office before as well, where the client just stares at me and is like, I don't know. I cannot think of something else. It's like, okay, well, that's what I'm here for, to help you think of a different way to look at it that brings you less anxiety. So we brainstorm that and we come up with different ways to think about it and they pick a way that feels right and best to them. That's another way we work with this. A final way I'm going to talk about today is hypnosis because this is a hypnosis podcast and I am an anxiety specialist that uses hypnosis in her practice. So I also teach very brief hypnosis techniques that someone can use just on the spot to help bring anxiety down. And then we also do some longer ones that they can do. But my goal for every client and for all of you listening to this podcast is to learn some self-hypnosis so that you're able to do that yourself. So it becomes something very comforting for you, becomes a tool in your toolbox that you can pull out and say, well, I know I can do this one technique to help me bring down anxiety. So I'm gonna teach you one really quick here. So this comes from an excellent book called The Affect Regulation Toolbox. And this is a simple exercise. Now, if you try this though, I'm gonna say this beforehand, and it's really uncomfortable for you to hold your eyes up towards your eyebrows, this isn't the tool for you. You can pick another tool to use, but not this one. But this is a really quick and effective tool that interrupts the physiological response of anxiety. Now, I don't want to to do this if you're listening to this podcast and you're driving. Okay, so let me just say that right now, or you're in a place that's not safe where you can't really do this. So wait for a time and a place where you can just practice this quick little tool where you're safe and comfortable. Here we go. I'd like you to stare up towards your eyebrows. And now take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold the breath while holding the extension of your eyeballs. Good. Now see if you can hold your eyes upward while slowly fluttering your eyelids closed. And now relax your eyes in your eye sockets and relax your breath and just float inside, floating, floating, perhaps to an image of yourself floating on an air mattress in a pool on a warm summer day. Or maybe you prefer an image of floating in a boat, a canoe or a rowboat. Or perhaps you prefer floating on a cloud of your childhood. It's a beautiful color, perfectly supportive. Against the backdrop of a clear blue sky. 
So pick an image that's pleasing to you. And I know this feeling is such a nice feeling of floating. And now gently take a deep inhale, exhale. And open your eyes and bring yourself back to awareness and do a check head to toe. Plant your feet and be aware of your surroundings. So you saw that took us a minute or two, maybe two minutes, but it's a quick, easy tool that you can use when anxiety hits. And you're in a place where you can do that. You're not always in a place where you can do that, but it's even a technique that you could be like, you know what, I need to use the bathroom. I'll be right back. And you could do it in the bathroom. That's how fast it is. But it just activates the part of your body that helps you calm down. Hey, that autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, all of those that just help you calm down. Just that image of floating. So nice. So that's a tool that you could use for home. And I teach several of these. That's actually like a beginner tool is what I call it. And we do that one sort of in the beginning of treatment. And then we go into more advanced tools that people can use. So I hope that helped you understand a little bit more about how to work with your own anxiety and your own panic attacks. I highly suggest if you are having regular panic attacks, meaning you know, more than a couple a year that you get help for them. Even a couple a year, if they're really uncomfortable for you, I'd get help for them. But certainly if you're having more than that, if you're having them, you know, I don't know, weekly basis, daily basis, absolutely get some help. There are some really, really good specialists out there. And generally the treatment goes quickly. There's a pretty well-known psychologist who talks about this, Stephen Phillips. And he says to his clients, your hand is on the steering wheel and your feet are on the gas and the brake pedal. I'm over here with the roadmap. Okay. So I can give you the roadmap, but how fast we get there is entirely up to you. And that is a great way to think about it. How fast you get there is entirely up to you and how you want to work with it and what you're capable of. And, you know, sometimes people need a longer time to work with it because they need longer recovery time in between. They need to process. We all process different ways. Other times people can just go boom, boom, boom and knock them right out. So don't ever get down on yourself if you feel like you're taking too long, quote unquote. I often hear that. And it's like, no, you're exactly where you need to be. You're processing at a pace that's best for you. You're changing at a pace that's comfortable for you to change. And I always feel like that is the client's prerogative at all times. All right, people, that's it for today. Hope you have a wonderful week. Peace. I hope you truly enjoyed today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you in helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace.